Good morning. Good morning. I'm David Graycheck, the pastor of the church. I can't see you right now because my, my glasses are dirty and with the lights on them, I can never see. Um, welcome this morning. We're so glad you could be with us. Glad for those of you who can be with us from home. Um, couple of Just a couple of announcements this morning. You can see that we've got our Bible study again on Thursday night at 530. We are beginning a, a new study in the coming weeks and looking for ideas. So keep that in mind. Um, we still haven't landed on anything yet because uh, I was asked about Revelation, and I'm going to tell you, we still haven't landed on anything yet. Uh, difficult subject, so it's really, really tough. Um, we are entering into the peak of our hurricane season, as you know. So the blessing bags that you see here, the items, if you happen to see uh, a chance to pick some of those up at the grocery store, please pick those up and, and bring those in. We're trying to prepare as much as we can. I want you to, in pencil, not in pen, in pencil, I want you to mark in your calendar um, Sunday, September 11th. Now, September 11th is a special day in our country anyway, but what we're thinking of doing is having a hurricane preparedness um, dinner, uh, cookout, barbecue with the neighborhood. Uh, so there's a couple things that, that we, you'll get more details on this, but that's the tentative date. Uh, what we'll need are, are a conversation with Wendy. I just saw you, Wendy. Um, and, and we'll need some volunteers, and then we'll also need um, to get the word out. We are going to have um, the police come and talk with us. 
the fire department come and talk with us and give us a, basically an idea of how to be best prepared in the case of a storm, uh, if there are any changes, and just to give another opportunity to step forward with that. But that would be the evening of the 11th, I'm going to guess around 5 o'clock. Um, and I was asked to do it later in the day from friends in the neighborhood because they like to fish, and I respect that. Um, so keep that in mind. If we put it in pencil, we'll let you know as soon as we have more details, which I'll have earlier uh, this week, but we'll, we'll let you know about that. Um, with that, you can see that there will there be more and more information coming out on two cents a meal. We don't have a number uh, down in our bulletin, but oh my gosh, there have been thousands of people that have been fed by our program. So I'm so grateful for your love for others with that. So please continue. Um, with that, let's, let's, let's enter into worship. Let's go ahead and please rise. You have an insert, I believe, that has the words for shine, Jesus shine. Also, I'm sure they'll be on the screen, but let's all rise and sing praise to our loving God. Loving God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time. We thank you for these friends. Lord, we thank you for our lives. We ask that you be with us in and amongst all of our conversations. We lift up to you uh, one of our friends who is dealing with very difficult medical issues. We lift up to you, Don Johnson. Uh, we ask, Lord, that you keep him in your prayers um, and, and keep him strong. 
help the doctors to understand how best to help him. But most merciful God, we confess that we drop the ball when it comes to our faith. We confess that what we have done, we have left others alone when we could have presented your love. Lord, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Loving God, we pray all of this in the same way that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us continue to sing what a friend we have in Jesus. my friends with the peace of our Lord in our hearts let me invite you to pass the peace and greet one another in the name of Jesus Christ
I know you all love to pass the peace and greet one another. There's also a, a fellowship time after the service uh, down outside of the fellowship hall on the way to the parking lot. Um, you'll see the crowd gather, but also you have the ability to be in the courtyard and uh, we have a big spacious room so you don't have to worry about your social distancing and whatnot. So that'll be afterwards. Uh, first scripture reading, it comes from James 1. Just a couple of verses. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As the elders come forward to receive this morning's offering, uh, I would ask that you pray for those. We, we are going to be uh, adding back to our service, praying for one another, but I would ask that you pray for one another. There's a lot of heartache going on, and there's a lot of joy. School has begun. Pray for the teachers, um, and, and pray for those youth that are getting used to new classmates, maybe new, new teachers, uh, new schedules. Um, so, so prayers abound. So as we Bring the offering. We, we ask that, that the Lord give us knowledge as how to best utilize the gifts of tithes and offerings. So please give.
Loving God, we thank you for all that we have and all that we are. Knowing that all that we have comes from you first, Lord, we ask that you please receive these gifts as us giving back to you from our first fruits. But Lord, more than anything else, please accept the gift of our lives that we give for the betterment of your kingdom. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. We're getting close to the end of First Thessalonians, I promise you. Got a few verses here, um, starting in verse 16. Get my eyes to work. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Friends, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord stands forever. Let's pray together. Loving God, we ask that you open our eyes and open our ears that we might clearly see and clearly hear what you would have us learn from this text. Lord, more than anything else, we ask that you open our hearts and make yourself a home. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we are coming to our concluding conversation. Uh, we've got a couple weeks left, so don't get excited. But blueprints for a healthy church. We're, we're trying to understand that God is reshaping our church right now. Uh, all churches, even though nobody gave them permission, that's what's going on. Um, and we're asking for if we are to reshape and redo and rebuild and renew, what does that look like? And how do we start with that? Well, it starts, like any other plan, with a blueprint. Uh, we have to begin with a blueprint. And, and I think that this text does a wonderful job for us because if you're anything like me, when you have free time, and usually that's when I'm driving somewhere, I ask a perplexing question, um, and, and it, it never leaves my mind, I guess. And it's, it's, it's this one, what is God's will for my life? God, what, what is your plan for my life? As I shared with the Bible study group the other night that I, I've been working on uh, authenticity in my life. And, and I recognize how God wanted me to do that because I really recognize that each one of us has been gifted at something. God has given us a gift in some way or other. And I think it's only when we are our true self that we can uncover what that gift may be. We get a better understanding of what that giftedness might be. In other words, say it the other way. If we're trying to be someone else or trying to be something else for other people to recognize, how are we going to recognize what God has gifted us to do in this world? And, and so it fits right in here when we ask the question, what is God's will for my life? When we ask that question, we generally, we generally want to know what, 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 maybe what job I should take, what school I should attend, maybe even which person, person I should marry. I had a beautiful conversation earlier this week with a young man who was dating someone, and, and he said, you know, we'll probably break up. I said, well, that's too bad. Why is that? Because I just don't see me marry, being married to her. And I thought, well, that's sad, but that's a very mature thing to say. So, so maybe that's part of what's growing inside of the young man is, is who should I marry? Maybe when we join the church, what ministry should I be involved in? Again, all of these, I believe, come full circle. And Lord, how have I been gifted? What's your will for my life? Often we ask a question at a crisis point in our life. And, and, and we should, don't get me wrong. Today's text, though, I think is going to take us just something that we normally think about with God's will. Something that we normally pour our lives into. I think our test suggests less <clears throat> that we ask, what is God's will for my life? But we need to have less emphasis on what does God want me to do. And more emphasis and more thought and more prayer in who does God want me to be? Different with doing and being. This text, um, 
I, I, I think there's standing orders for the church. So as we have been going First Thessalonians for a while all summer, um, it is really a, a text that are building blocks and, and, and important for the church. Be joyful always. I mean, it, people look to the church to be the answer that's going on in the world, I believe. And I think the church is the answer for the issues that are in the world today. The world might be unhappy, but the church is to be filled with joy. If, if, and I won't go into it too far, but um, if you read the end of a story, you have more fun reading it as you go, reading the last chapter. I do that. Um, and and I, I've read the last chapter of how this whole thing works out with my life. And it's good. Salvation is mine because Jesus is my Lord. And so uh, I live in that world. I live with the idea of knowing how it's going to end. Why would the hard things get my attention more so than the joy of how I know this whole thing ends? All of us have that. Also, it says pray continually. Pray all the time. And give thanks in all circumstances. These are, these, these are given to us, these verbs in the Greek are given to us in, in a tense that's called imperative. Now, what do I mean by that? There, there's, uh, we talked about this Thursday night. There, there, there's a, a verse, Psalm, Psalm 4610, where God says, be still and know that I am God. We read that as a gentle, loving stroke of the cheek. Be still. It's okay. I am God. But it's an imperative, meaning be still. It, it, it's, it's forced upon us that, that I know you think you've got all these things going on. I know your mind goes a million miles an hour. I know, David, you think about ten things at once. Knock it off. Be still. I need you to know one thing for sure. I am God. In the same way here. I know there's lots of things that you're trying, lots of things that you're trying to be, trying to do, trying to, to take care of. But be joyful always, always. Pray. Pray continually. Always be in conversation with God. And give thanks all the time, not just when good things happen to you. It's imperative. We're being commanded to do these things. Paul's not, he's not talking about our feelings. For the most part, we can't control feelings. Paul's addressing our mindset, our focus, how we approach life, not how we react. I've titled the message um, purposely. It's simple to understand, but difficult to do. Simple to be, but difficult to do. Um, we know God wants us to be joyful, praying, and, and filled with thanksgiving. How are we doing? It isn't easy, is it? The modifiers here is what's important. The modifiers of these verse were to always be joyful, continually pray, and thankful in all circumstances. So I want to talk about these three a little bit. In Philippians, Paul told us to rejoice in the Lord always. I say again, rejoice. It's a common theme. It's a great book. Um, if you're having a tough time, it's a book of joy. It's a great one. Before we can begin to understand, though, I think what this means, we have to be clear what it doesn't mean. Paul is not telling us that we should be happy all the time. That's not what Paul is saying. There are many things that bring us unhappiness. And, and in our lives, we're built that they would bring us unhappiness. Circumstances such as grief, sadness, a sense of bewilderment. That happens. God doesn't want us to be phony. God wants us to be real. Sometimes we're not happy. And that's going to happen. But I think what Paul is saying is don't lose heart. Don't lose out to that day. That day is going to happen. That storm in your life, it's going to happen. Don't let it win the day. Don't let it change who you are. Joy, it, it, it's, it's deeper than happiness. It's, it's unrelated to the circumstances of life. It's anchored in that right relationship with God. 
It's that exhilaration of spirit that derives from the deep-seated confidence of God's love, God's power, and God's work in our lives. Who God is, is the anchor of why that joy never goes away. Because God is unending and never changing. The deeper our relationship with God, the more joy we know how to lean into. So let's state the obvious. If you don't have a true and vital relationship with God, you have all the feels of this world, but you don't really have joy. We often miss out on joy because we try to create it for ourselves. When we try to produce joy, I think we're working against true joy. When, when we're relying on external things, we're distracted from the internal work that God's Spirit does within us. Our instinct is to try to do things to produce joy. But joy comes from resting, not running. It comes from trusting, not working. It comes from within. But then Paul doesn't stop there. Paul says, pray continually. That's easy. Pray continually. The second command is, is actually pray without ceasing. Don't stop. Pray, pray. Paul's encouraging us. Constant communication and relation with God. Don't let that break. Communication in a marriage takes place constantly. And don't go elbowing each other. It does whether you're talking to each other or not. Guys, we know what it's like to get the look. We know the look. We communicate through words, actions, through silence in a marriage. Have you noticed that people who have been married a while often finish, finish each other's sentences? Stacy, if she was feeling better, would be here and nodding her head, saying yes. Many times something will be said and the other will, will have the exact same response. We will hear a song or, or a statement on the radio driving down the road and we're thinking about a movie we saw years and years and years ago at the same time. I swear we've got one mind going on right now. At, at, at times it's maddening. A conversation is progressing and all of a sudden a husband or a wife start talking about something totally unrelated because it has brought up something that they were talking about before. They've shared lives with each other to such a degree that they've begun to think exactly the same. This is the kind of relationship that praying continually does with God. You know how to finish each other's sentences. Wouldn't it be great? If in this kind of relationship with God, um, you could continue the conversation with God in, in regular, in regularly, you knew what God would say in any given moment without even having to ask. That's the point, right? Wouldn't it be great if you could hear his voice of love in your head in every crisis? People wonder, what in the world would I talk to God about all day long how am I going to pray continually how in the world is that possible prayer is meant to be a conversation like that but as we talk Thursday night how often in our prayers are we the only one talking that's that be still thing David shut up I know what your needs are Oh, God, take care of this. Take care of so-and-so. Take care of this. I love so-and-so. Help them. David, be quiet. I don't let God get a word in edgewise sometimes. There are times when we do need to confess our sins or something we've thought of in our past that we want to let go of and we want to be sure and let go of everything. Times when we want to express appreciation for God and God's creative wonders. There, there, there are times... When we should express our love. Times when we want to give thanks. We simply need to align our hearts. But there are times when we need to just allow it to be still. Allow it to be quiet. And just be. Many in the world today call that meditation. We call it prayer. 
Just be with God in that moment. Paul then goes on to suggest that we need to, to give thanks in all circumstances. Again, I think we need to qualify this. Paul's not saying that we need to give thanks for all circumstances. Because I'm not thankful that I had COVID a month ago. I'm not thankful for that. Obviously, we need to be thankful for, we, 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 we should not be thankful for the injustices that we see, maybe tragedy, maybe disease, for war. None of these things are things to be thankful for. We're to be thankful in every circumstance. In other words, the circumstances are going to happen. It's important that we understand, like joy, our thankfulness is anchored in our relationship with Christ rather than in our circumstances of life. No matter what happens in life, Scripture teaches us we can be grateful that nothing can separate us from the love of God. That's in Romans 8. God is working in every circumstance, even the circumstances that aren't good in and of themselves, for our good. That's throughout Romans also. God has promised to supply all of our needs and give us strength. We learned that in Philippians 4. We also can be grateful that no one can snatch us from God's hand. John 6. On and on and on I could go with scriptures. There are promises in the Bible about who God is. It's about who God is. And God loving us enough to place his spirit in us so that we don't have to try and figure it out on our own. The more and more we spend some time recognizing that, the more and more we will find the ability to be thankful in everything, the ability to pray constantly. So, let me apply this even further. In the case of death, of someone we love, we can be grateful because we know that there is life beyond the grave. It doesn't seem possible and we don't talk about that, but we can. In the case of a devastating illness, we can be grateful that God knows our weaknesses and promises to give us strength. In the case of injustice, we can be grateful that God will vindicate us. On and on. In the case of job loss, we can be grateful that in every situation works for his good. God will work each situation for our good. The point is this. If we focus on the circumstances of life, we turn into grumblers. I know grumblers in my life. I've met grumblers. If we focus on God, who God is, what God has done for each and every one of us, rather than grumblers, we'll be thankers. I don't know if those are words. I made them up. But they worked this morning. Nowhere will you see anywhere where life was promised to be easy. There's no such thing. In fact, Jesus told his disciples in John 16, in the world you will have tribulation, but I have overcome the world. This tribulation isn't as big as our loving God. It's a perspective that we have with a gracious heart. I gotta, I gotta admit something. I'm the pastor, on and on and on, whatever. I struggle with these commands. If you told me you're perfect, Adam, I would ask you again, are you sure? It isn't easy. Too often, though, I find myself swallowed up by complaints rather than gratitude. A sour mood rather than an attitude of deep-seated joy. I admit, at times, I have to remind myself that I haven't had a conversation with God in a while, in an hour, in a day. 
what God desires from us isn't unreasonable. And it surely isn't impossible. But we need to stop looking at these verses as if they're some kind of grand exaggeration. We can be joyful always. We can pray without ceasing. And we can always be grateful for all things. It depends on our relationship with God. So, time for us to get serious. Let's be honest with ourselves. We lack joy because we lose sight of God. It's that simple. Or we've forgotten. We're forgetful folk. I can remember stealing home to win the state championship when I was 14 years old on an all-star team um, like it was yesterday. Such a joy. But you know what? I can forget the loving God that did all of these things for me so that I might live an abundant life and be able to share love and experience love and, and express it in so many different ways. I forget that all the time. And I have to come back and on my knees say, Lord, I'm sorry. I, I've lost focus. We can do that. We become lax in our prayerfulness. It's just something that we can set aside because it's like an extra thing that you can do rather than a life that we've been called to. We can find gratitude elusive because we, well, we just put our focus in the wrong place, is all. It's uh, called the tyranny of the urgent. The stuff that's going on around us begs for more attention. And usually that stuff isn't very good. We must remember that doing the will of God starts by being the person of God. Because God has called us to be. And only from that point do we start to imitate the relationship in Him. I, think, I mean, I, I think I love about these commands is if you really start working on them, if you work on one, the others follow. They build on each other. These commands in and of themselves are building blocks. If you find it hard to pray continually, well, well, focus. Focus on joy. And I promise you, I'll make a bet with you, whatever you want to say, that you begin praying more and more because of the joy that's going on in you. You focus on living a thankful life, I'll bet you'll find yourself talking to Lord, the Lord even more, thanking the Lord for what's going on in your life. That's how it works. The bottom line is just start somewhere. Start somewhere. Here are some simple, simple suggestions. We often tell children that they need to check in with us periodically. I was talking to my daughter about that last night, about how we used to make sure that whatever they were doing to check in. I used to run all over the city when I was a kid. Now, keep in mind, um, we were a smaller community in Nebraska, so you could do that. But we could, do, we could go wherever, so long as we checked in. As God's children, wouldn't it make sense for us to check in as well? We often tell, um, well, you might feel yourself getting anxious about something going on in your life or uptight, uptight about events that are going on in your life. I promise this will help to refocus when we look to the Lord. When you sit back and you, you take a moment during that stressful time, and I know it isn't easy, so you have to tell yourself to do it. How would God view this? When you face a daunting task, you need to ask yourself, and I've done this, do I trust God or not? And if you do, give it a go. Be joyful always. Pray continually. And be thankful in all things.
Let's pray together. Loving God, you are more ready to have a conversation with us than we are ready to sit down and shut up. I recognize that, God. I thank you for your patience. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your simple instructions. A two-word verse. Be joyful. Pray continually. Lord, help us to understand that you know our situation, but if we are to hear from you, we need to be in a posture to do so. Lord, step into our lives, step into the difficulty, step into the life of my friend Don. Strength, courage, and resolve. We all need these things. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all rise. Let's all rise and sing our closing hymn, O Zion, haste. Let's, let's sing together. Yeah, the Bible gives us tough instruction, gives us hard things to do. 
But I lean into that fact that we wouldn't be asked to do it if we weren't capable. God knows what we're capable of. My friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the light of the Lord's countenance shine upon your face and give you peace. Go now. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And all God's children said,